Hello and welcome. Today I am delighted to be joined by Richard Hussaining, who is the founder at Men Behind Sports. So I'm really intrigued to learn more about you, Richard, because uh, we, we interacted following um, one of my previous podcasts. Um, since then, I've, I've looked more into your work and I just think it's a really important topic, an interesting topic for me personally, but just for the wider community. So thank you for joining, Richard. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you so much for, for being able to have this chat. Great. No, no, I'm looking forward to, to picking into it a little bit more. Um, but just like, and all, I'll start off about how you, where your background is, but you just, just mention to me just like what men behind sport, just give me a quick overview of what that is before we go into your background. Yeah, it's a coaching service to support the men behind sport. And when I say men behind sport, there are some amazing women in sport, with female coaches, practitioners, whatever. So, however, the lens that I see it through is that many men are, uh, and we're, because it's linked to my own story, which I'll say in a minute, but, um, you know, a common statement would be I'm, I'm uh, developing athletes or I'm improving athletes at the expense of myself. And so there's so much support for athletes, whether the athletes take that or not is a different question. But there is uh, there is much more support. And again, depending on I suppose the level of athlete, podium level athletes going to receive more more support. But there's generally a, a, an overview and an awareness that, you know, working at high level, high pressure environments it has a cost. And so athletes do have that support. There is very little that I've found that I certainly experienced, but also now look at doing from the angle I look at. There's, I would say, there's there's such small amount of support for men and coaches, let's say practitioners with working in elite sport, um, that it's just something that I, it's just it's just something that I want. My reason, my journey has is my why to why I'm founded this really because there's nothing there. And I want to provide a service. Well, I do provide a service that I didn't have as a coach. Great. No, no, I'm looking forward to how, hearing how you got, got to where you are. So where were you from originally? From Brighton in Sussex in sunny England. Um, but as I was saying to you before, I've kind of moved away, come back, moved away for various different reasons. But um, yeah, Brighton is my home. Right. And so when you were growing up then, did you have any aspirations of what you wanted to do? I was a relatively good cricketer, um, kind of dabbled in junior county level. Um, and really, I didn't know. Um, sort of a well, pivotal moment for me in my childhood, my dad died when I was 16. He had a stroke when I was 13 um, and because he was an alcoholic. And um, so he died when I was 16. And really that, that I mean, really from third, well, my whole childhood sort of it's it, skewed me and so I dropped out of I just about made it through school I dropped out of college um, I tried a few times to get into college and then I went abroad um, first time I lived abroad was in a French, in a French ski resort and I did a couple of seasons I worked in a summer uh, season in in Greece and my point is saying that um, one that experience of stepping out and and you know I, I felt such a failure because I wasn't attaining what everyone else around me was to getting this perspective of meeting all these new people, all these different people in such a beautiful environment. And three, I guess, fast forward to the work I do now. The reason I mention that is because I'm really interested. An element of my work is I'm really interested in how men assign role models and benchmarks of success. Because what I did and what kept me in a hole was I was assigning, trying to achieve these levels of success based on material aspects of who I thought was successful, how someone looks, the type of money they have relationships girls that kind of stuff which took me down pretty dodgy roads um i'm glad i came out of them lucky enough to steer out of them and so in terms of working in elite sport when i came back from my ski resorts i wanted to be involved with sports still and i just had this from from someone who i thought just didn't i was just never academic i never was going to do that i then did a personal training qualification i did a sports massage qualification in the london school of sports massage i then did my degree, which is a, a sports therapy out of Chichester, and then I went straight into my master's of strength and conditioning. And it's just this snowball effect of, all oh, right, okay, you did that, did that, done that, done that. And then again, another area I'm interested in in my work is, you know, I thought that if I, I need to be successful in this, I need to work at the top level. And so that was my laser focused kind of, and it was, I did my first degree at 26. So I'm grateful I came to it later in life. And I'm great I had that that earlier experience, I suppose. 
that was your question yeah no no it does no it does that's that's really interesting so just to unpick some of those things then so in terms of those role models that you you mentioned there i guess everyone is always comparing themselves to other people and people talk about how you know social media not being great for it now but how did that manifest itself for you then when who who were your people that you were perceiving as successful i mean as a teenager it was kind of people people that are um would be described on the on the on wrong side of the tracks you know like um they'd have disposable income they'd have you know like just just uh just colorful people who are who are not treading the normal path and so I, I did hang around with a group and then um i guess what made me snap back was one of them one of them was killed uh was pushed out of a window over something to do with drugs and it was really like wow i do not want my life to be like this um i'd already experienced a bit of loss before that obviously my dad and, and someone else and um, and so it was like a real wake-up call for me like right this is not this is not right this is not where i want to go it didn't feel right in any part of me and but even before he died you know he he was just uh himself has been broken down by that type of environment and anyway, and so, so, and that's when I went away. And so my role models when I came back were kind of, you know, like I wanted to work in, in you know, professional football, um, kind of looking at the top sportsmen and then looking and starting to understand what, who supports them and looking at the different roles that are available. And, and then for me, at the English Institute of Sport, when I started to really understand kind of the, the professional environment and the support structures that are in place, the EIS were, were my main focus. And so that's, that's kind of what I aim for. And so do you think that was anything different to other people of your age and set up at that time? When I was 16, that type of age? Mm-hmm. Um, was I different? I guess I was, yeah. I mean, because most of my friends from school were going to college doing, doing A-levels and they were going to university and I didn't have the A-levels to go to university. And so, you know, like, uh, one, I guess one thing that did keep me on the straight and I, I was a postman for two years and um, you know the early starts getting up in the summer is beautiful you know I'd be done by half nine and I'd be out all day and, and so yeah like I, I was even though I was desperate to fit in and not stand out I was very much choosing a path to stand out I wasn't doing the normal at all one because I was I just I had no options to do the same as everyone else at that time or I wasn't succeeding at the, you know, A levels um, and GCSE, uh, sorry, A levels and, uh, and degree. But two, it was just, um, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity that came up to go abroad and, and in the ski resort because that really showed me a very different way of living. Mm. It's interesting. I was chatting with my colleague earlier on today and we were talking about it. And she was saying that her husband went through the vocational route and has gone on to do really, really well in, in their accountancy. And I, for sure can empathize you want to convey a belt when you go in there oh yeah you do a levels mm. i was very immature wouldn't have been probably sh- maybe should or shouldn't have done that i don't know to touch and go going to yeah. university everyone else did it i was way too immature to do it yeah, and in, I, as much as i loved it and it was it's worked out well for me i i probably would have thrived more in a working vocational environment but you almost not given that's almost not acceptable because everyone, mm. I'd say 90, 95 percent of my friends were you on the conveyor belt. That's what you do. You go to university. It's not even a, a thought. Um, mm. So how did you did, did, did that affect you? The fact that you weren't doing that then? Yeah, I just I, I mean, it, it's been a story through. It was a story for me throughout my life and not being good enough. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm grateful for grateful for all the, the challenge and pain I've been through because it's allowed me to look at myself in different ways through various different strategies, you know, and therapy has been one element that has helped me. And there are many, I can talk about other practices that I've done that have opened my eyes to uh, a deeper level understanding of life, but kind of the idea of like just really looking at yourself. And so, you know, like when a parent, my, when my father was unavailable because he was just out of his face drunk and for one, you know, that's not, that was his tool. He was suffering himself, and that was his only. That's what the tool he knew, and that's what he was using. So, as an adult, I can see, and you know, I, I I completely forgive what he did. You know, he was suffering, but as a child, you don't know any different. And 
so I, you know, I would ask him not to drink and he would still drink because of course he would. And so my point in saying that is, um, I was always feeling, and I wasn't aware of it, but I was always feeling not good enough. And so it just strengthened it. It just strengthened. It. And I think, you know, the conversations at that age, young age, I was very naive and, and immature. And I think as a society, we our, our conversations are don't are not deep. They're just superficial. We, we scoff, scoff like, oh, how are you doing? I'm fine. Like just a general, general greeting. When in, and I'm not saying we all need to open up and share our pain, but I, I think there's um that's one of the, again one of the drivers like to, to start a conversation of what's actually happening you can accept that and you can or you can deny it it might affect you it might not affect you and that's all right but i think kind of without without bringing this to the surface it's um and we're all governed by our blueprints and our blueprints are laid down in our childhood and as a parent now my wife and i you know we're, we're doing our best in a way that we think is right for our daughter and we have to fully accept that what we're doing at some point, our daughter is going to have to let go of some of that and have to work through that. And that's fine. That's normal because it might not work for her what we're doing. And so, you know, so when I say, you know, like, you know, everyone is doing their best, every parent is doing their best, but we all have a blueprint. And so until we become aware of that blueprint, it runs our lives and our thoughts, feelings, actions are based off that blueprint. And usually pain is what, wakes us up enough to want to look at that mm. yeah definitely and so how did you feel then when you were doing your sports therapy course was that something you, you enjoyed very much yeah i was very much um kind of I was, I was engaged in life then i was you know I'd, i was i had changed so much and i was engaged and i really enjoyed sports therapy i thought i was going to go into physio masters um but then like the training element was was pulling at me more and so i went straight to my masters and i really enjoyed the study i really did enjoy it and it was I was happy, you know, and that's, that's really important to say that up until 2014, I was really happy. Like work was everything to me. Sport was everything to me. I was an SSC coach. It wasn't what I did. It was who I was. And I couldn't see the problems with that. And I couldn't feel the problems with that. I was actually really happy in what I was doing um, most of the time. Mm. So, yeah, so when, when you'd finish your um, a sports therapy degree what made you want to do snc then rather than physio uh much of that was again based on an underconfidence you know that the skill of a, of a sports therapist or physio is it's amazing you know to be able to diagnose and and to assess and i just didn't feel confident in it one two the snc in my eyes at that time was uh could have more impact in an athlete's development. Again, that was just my lens. I'm not saying that's true. I disagree with that actually. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just it, for me then. It was um, it's just more of an attractive, more of an attractive and and an easier route. Mm. How did you feel? And bear in mind what you've said about like your um, self esteem and, and so on, because physios we, we we've got two sports therapists on the team who are amazing, great characters. But there's I can still sense in them and across the, the board, physios, sports therapists, there's still a dynamic of maybe whether we'd call it snobbery or judgment. Well, did you perceive anything of that when you were doing your course or when you were choosing whether to do physio or not? No, I, no, I didn't actually. Um, I, I felt the, a clash between SNC and physio. Um, but I didn't feel within that environment. And I, I, I heard about the, the sports therapy and physiotherapy. Yeah, I heard about that clash, but it, you know, ultimately, I didn't pursue it into a full-time career, and so um, it didn't really, it didn't really affect me. And I, I, you know, even then, what 2006, I remember them saying that the charter was going to accept sports therapists, and they still haven't, by, by all accounts. You know, so, so whatever. There's a um, yeah, <laughs> an open discussion still going on, I'm sure, about that space. Yeah. So why did you do your um, S&C then? At St Mary's in Twickenham. Um, okay. That's a two-year master's, uh, which was amazing. You know, like it was part-time. Well, not part-time. It was two years, but there's only a couple of weeks per year placement. The rest was, you know, you can study at home and just about going to get work. And I was working at the time for Fulham, um, Fulham Football Club. I started off as a sports master and then went into more... Um, the kind of bit of rehab and then into like academy SNC under Sean Tag, 
this is years ago, and then went into rugby league for a season under Nick Reese, and then I got into the AIS. Right. So how did you get the job at Fulham? Was that your first job in sport? First job, um, I was a sports like sports master. I was just reaching out to all, you know, just a relentless pursuit of sending CVs, calling up, emails, like it, it's just relentless. And, and I'm sure many of your listeners know, you know, anyone who's got into sport will know that that the challenge of just getting getting even answered an email answered is so hard. And um, but yeah, like Mo O'Connell, Martin O'Connell was there at the time, and um, yeah, just very open and, and began straight away with the first team and then got into uh, pretty much full-time with the first team traveling to all the games went uh went pre-season tour that kind of stuff and it was yeah really fun really fun bearing in mind that had been you'd be wanting to get into that world and now you're working with a premier league then yes and um chris coleman uh and and, I, and at the time, you know, I remember thinking, "Wow, like I'm working in Premier League team already," but it didn't feel enough. It was like I'm still not, I'm still not, I'm still not achieved anything. That's kind of how I remember how it felt. And if I'm honest, that's how it always felt throughout my career. Like I still haven't achieved. And it ties me back to that quote I said, you know, that the, the paraphrase quote of like, "Of oh, my the athletes I work with have achieved Olympic success, championship success, but I have, I'm waiting for this emotional rush to hit, but I haven't got it." And it was. It was, I'm lucky to have worked with some really great athletes in my time, but at Fulham, it's still like, I'm, well, I'm working at Premier League club. I'm going to the games I'm with the team, but it didn't feel um, something was missing. Yeah. Yeah, and so what, how old were you at that point? 23 to about 27, if I remember correctly, 27, 28. Yeah. And then, so what made you move on to the, the rugby? More primarily as an SNC role. So an uh, intern, SNC intern. And then did that for a season. And then and then the opportunity came out with the EIS. And I, and I got the job with the EIS. And then I was with the EIS for three years, about three years. What was, the role, what was that role at EIS? Uh, strength and conditioning coach to the British divers at the Southampton site. So I'd be working at Bisham Abbey, which is one of their high performance centres. And I'd also be working at... Um, Southampton with Pete Waterfield and um, Chris Mears and uh, Lindsay Fraser was the head coach down there and, I, and Stacey Powell like, really really great time um, uh, building up into the London 2012 Olympic Games and, and being there is just, you know it's an amazing experience mm, Yeah Bisham Abbey is an incredible place isn't it mm. so picturesque all around that mm. little Marlow area yeah, yeah, lovely. It is lovely. Yeah, were you living around that area then, or were you still? No, always in Brighton, so always commuting. Um, even like now, I, I took my, my wife's American. She went to America um, over Easter, and I remember driving, like going down to Heathrow, and that was not even a bit. You know, I still had probably another forty-five minutes or forty minutes to get from Heathrow to Bisham Abbey, and I remember thinking, "Wow, I did this." And I went to Southampton, you know, two, three times a week as well. I was like, "Gosh, people do it every day." Wow, how did I do that? <laughs> Yeah, so, but Brighton has always been, um, yeah, I, yeah, I lived in Thatcham and near Reading for a few years, um, pre-degree, but uh, yeah, Brighton's always been my home in England. Yeah, and then, so you were doing the S&C for, for the um, for the diving team then, so was that, that was up to and including the, the Olympics? Yeah, London, 12, Olymp London 2012 Olympic Games, which was really great, a uh, really exciting time, and then at the end of sort of that year, or I think it's maybe in yeah December 2012 or January 2013, uh, someone at uh, recruitment at Exos just sent me an email, just said, oh, we've got positions in China available. Would you like to apply? And so I applied and, um, and got a job with Exos in Shanghai and, the, and Beijing. Um, so I kind of was between the two, mainly in Shanghai, but with their started with their Olympic diving um, and judo in Beijing. Um, and then I was in Shanghai with their judo and a bit of multi-sport down there. And that was a, just an amazing life experience. And moving from EIS, which was, you know, the, I put it on a pedestal for such a long time. And it was, you know, the, the epitome of, I guess, high perform elite high performance in a Western world. And then going to China, the, the absolute polar opposite, which, and that's why it was so good for me. Because I was so caught up in processes and frameworks, and not to dismiss that, it's really important. But I was so lost, and it just really helped me, like you know, to even navigate the cultural difference, to be able to get buy-in, to be able to get people to trust you. Because you know, it, it's like 
the Olymp Chinese Olympic Committee brought us in, exiled us in, it wasn't the teams that brought us in. And so they were all of a sudden given these Westerners, here you go, here's a coach. Well, they didn't ask for it. You know, so, so you, you met like, oh, all right. You know, we're not, we're not interested in what you've got to say because you're not Chinese and you don't know. And, you know, can't argue. Like and that's what was so wonderful. EIS supporting many world-class athletes and then China producing world-class athletes time and again. And yes, some of the methods were wild. However, it still worked in their situation. And so they thought, well, what have you got to offer? So it was really like the, one of the wonderful skills to, to learn is like, well, how do you, how do you get by with someone who doesn't speak your language? and doesn't trust you because you're a foreigner. I don't want you here. So that was just a wonderful, and then the life experience of the craziness of China, the ability, like needing to let go, I was so caught in control. And that was the beginning of my, you want to call it spiritual awareness or, or development as a person, as a man, because it was requiring me to look at life in a different way. So go back to what you said there about how, how did you deal with that then, where you've got a very, say, un unwelcoming, if I'm paraphrasing for you, environment to go in. You're quite new to Exos at the time, I presume. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, you know, there's a small Exos team there. Um, it was really, I just thought, you know, if, to start with, it was more like right, going to the sessions and just tidy up. You know, I didn't try and change anything other than just try and t tidy up some technique. And then I began to just collect. There's no, no, no form of monitoring or, or testing or anything like that. And so I just started to collect off my own back, like just to collect very simple measures like RPE. And they had a, a jump mat. So just looked at sort of a different variety of jumps and just a, on a daily basis and just see what came up. And then I collected that for about three months. And then this picture came up. I mean, this is a while ago now. This is 2013. But along the lines of, you know, looking at kind of, ebbs and flows of um, the outputs and the measures and it kind of married up with the RPE. And then I said, well, this is interesting, you know, during this phase, like the, everyone was pretty, pretty tired through this phase. What are you trying to do? And they, they, it was just more like it helped them with their program. It wasn't my idea. I was just saying, look, this is what's happening. Is that, is that useful to you? And it was just like, they're like, rather than feel threatened by me, it was more like, oh, wow, that's really helpful. Okay. What do you mean by this? And it became a, a discussion, a conversation, and it just opened up. There was a trust built, and I wasn't trying to, you know, I think they were just felt threatened, you know, by this this guy coming in, you know, or this company coming in, and it, it just started a wonderful conversation. And, you know, like part of the Chinese culture, I'm not sure if you experienced that when you went, but a, a, a way of showing respect is to take people out and then to get wasted on Baijiu. I don't know if that's your experience that, but, um, you know, we'd all be taken out by their coaches and, you know, this, this judo coach is very serious, very powerful man, big physically, but also just very strong, just getting hammered, on, you know, and uh, on the floor, literally. And then I remember saying the next day, he's just back to the normal self. And, it, and just there was this, this mutual kind of respect to been built. And um, well, he assumed I could take a drink. And, and it was just like, it just turned into this really nice um, working environment. Yeah, no, that's interesting. If someone else mentioned to me when I said I was going to China, like, oh, yeah, the big drinkers over there. And that would never, I don't know, I just wouldn't, I don't know, for whatever reason, I wouldn't associate that. But yeah, that, that um, little Bajor. wine, they call mm. it wine. It's not. Yeah. No, it's, it's not absolutely, wine. It's hideous. <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely hideous. Fifty-two percent or something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, rocket fuel. Yeah. No, we had we had a few of those ones, and that that's that's actually what made me have to get up and sing One Direction, which is that's that's <laughs> that's for another day. Um. Yeah. Well, no, I was surprised by that, and but yeah, they're, they're very very good hosts, as, as as you were saying there. Um. And so, what was it like from a support network, from an Exos perspective for you then? I've, I've met Mark Verstegen a few times, and I've seen him talk, and it's really impressive. I've been to the facility in Phoenix, uh, very impressive setup. What was it like working for them? I mean, if I'm completely honest, I was working under the label of Exos, but I, I you know, I haven't done any, any of the um, qualifications. Uh, the team was led by Rhett Larson, really lovely guy. Uh, in the ground was Shanghai and while in Beijing we kind of and then just a really close group of us over there Mike Minthorn who's now in Brazil Chris Spring in Canada um Greg Deer uh Michael Yu and it's just a really tight group and so yeah yes I had the Exos badge in my shirt but 
I didn't feel part of Exos, but I felt part of that team, you know. And and so it was just a, but you know, Rhett had been brought up in the Exos way, and and Mike had done it, and so it was just really nice. Um, it was just a solid group of us, like a small group of us that were tight and were friends as well as coaches, and um, and they still are friends today. Mm. And what was it like then for you? Then did you have a family at that point? No, I was, I was, um, I was in a relationship. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, I was in a relationship and just um, and burned the candle at both ends and lost, uh, just not being, just lost, lost in myself. You know, I thought I was. I, wrote, I remember walking through Shanghai streets and you know skyscrapers and you know. I, I fell in love with China before I went to China and, and I know it's not China, but um, in Blade Runner, you know, like it was LA actually, but this kind of Chinese writing and the high scrape. And I, I, I was there one night and I, I was in Shanghai. I remember thinking, oh, I've made it. I'm all right. You know, earning good money and living in the other side of the world. And then, but ironically, I was, I was just about to go through this massive event that I couldn't see. And, um, and so, yeah, yeah, I, I, I did have a relationship, but it was just, um, I was, I was, uh, not happy in myself. Yeah. So, what was it like then being in China? Then, just like in, in that scenario, it's just like it again. Even when I was over there for a few days, it's, it did feel. I guess this, this is even more modern. It's so different. It is so different, and even though it's developed to some extent now, it's just it's a very different cultural change. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. And, and you know, I think the, the biggest lesson I learned as a person was how to let go, let go of expectation, let go of what I was trying to control. Because I don't know if you experienced in China, but, you know, Chinese will say something and it, they don't mean it's probably get lost in translation. But also um, we've just got a different way of doing things. And, and, and that's the way it's fine. That's all right. I was the foreigner in their country and I was, I was trying to imprint what I wanted and my ways and the frustrations i'm sure whether you experienced or not but you know it's such a common talking about with expats over there the chinese are like this but they're such wonderful people and it was on me it was my i needed to adapt to them they didn't need to adapt to me and that was the lesson that i learned over that time you know stop thinking stop thinking everything has to be my way i have to i have to be adaptable and and that's what it taught me so it was it was amazing living there and you know i had a i had a nice i had a really wonderful balance of expat life partying and all that kind of stuff and being invited into you know real chinese homes for dinner being taken out to real chinese restaurants traveling with a team to places i can't i don't even know the names somewhere in china all around china wild out you know where i was literally the only western person i've been stared at like as an alien and at the time, they were quite hard times to be a few weeks away in a, in a place where the food is not the, not what I'm accustomed to and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, such character building and, and the, those experiences stay with me still today. You know, well, I never would have seen those places had it not been for my, my job. Mm. How long were we there for then? Nearly three years. Nearly three years. Um, and, yeah, amazing time. And the only reason I left uh, was to come home to give end of life care to my mum. Uh, so that was early 2015. And so I had to leave my job, which means leave my home, leave my friends at the time, you know, there. And it was, it was just this, this all of a sudden on the entering into this, this life changing time in my life. And, um, and it still impacts me today in a positive way. And so, yeah, in 2015, uh, sorry, beginning of 2015, gave end of life care to my mum. And it, and obviously, obviously, very tragic and very sad and it was has been the most transformational experience of my life because it gave me such a huge spiritual awareness if and all i mean by that is awareness of self why do i think this why do i do that why do i believe that and it just highlighted to me for the first time i could see that i was using my job as a as a veneer to hide a very low self-worth you know i was always on the treadmill of like what's next right i've got this job now where do i need to go after this how am i gonna get that job i need to go up 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 in seniority in prestige and all this kind of stuff and um and i didn't know why and i asked first first time i could see oh that's why i'm doing it and it just put me on the spiral of questioning that, that still goes and i think ultimately we touched on it at the beginning you know like there's the first time i would we're all going to get a chance and i would i would i would my experience would be to to take it 
to be at the end of life someone that you care and love about because that's that's real life right there and it might sound terrifying it might sound you know but there's such a such a privilege to to be there and it also made me realize wow i'm gonna die one day what does that mean the spiral of thinking and whereas someone i used to push that away now i actually actively reflect on that and what that does for me it allows me to live closer to to no fear i still have fear i still have doubt sometimes but it allows me right is this worth it is this what i want to do yes okay step forward even though it's scary even though people might doubt me even though people might not might disagree with me like it, if you know what we know for sure is is this there's this one life and so step into it what do i want to do so that that was all stemmed from um from, from looking after your mum how how long was that period it's quick like she was diagnosed in the end of 2014 died in April 2015 and um and she had very aggressive uh, thyroid cancer so and then from so April 2015 I, I was I, I tried to re-engage back into work I got a, a job with um Hinsa with uh, a testing with a Formula One test driver um I was just all over, I was like I was underwater kind of I just what is going on um that that I kind of on and off of that. And then I got a short contract with the EIS in October to December with the army boxes. And then I got a contract um, in January, 2016 to travel with this, with a hinter again, travel with this um, very wealthy businessman. And it took me around to Dubai and Thailand and, um, and I actually met my wife in Thailand there. And um, I think my point in saying that story is it just be, like that whole time I just started to open up to, new ways new things new perspectives i stopped reading research i just couldn't face it i just didn't want to look at any performance research ever again and i just thought it was a phase but in fact it was like no this is this is done i'm done with this this part of my life and the grief of that the pain of like letting go and i think that's what i come one of the major sticking points I, I work with people coaches on is like the identity the identity of working in professional sport who am i if i don't work in sport of all the sacrifices taken to get the position i have to keep going but then so many are doing it. I think you can work in sport for a, a lifelong career as long as you're aware of yourself and what your drivers are. So why do you think it had such a profound impact on you that, that you actually thought, I want to make a change here? Um, I, was, I was not being truthful to myself. I was not being truthful to other people. And it, could, it finally allowed me to see it. I knew that, but it finally allowed me to see it. Like what... What, yeah, what grief does, grief is a doorway to transformation if you can step into it. it. It's terrifying to step into it. But there's, you know, once you've been, that was safely my lowest point of my life, broken. And so from that point, you start to rebuild. Like you start to, I start to notice like, well, what do I want to do? Who do I want to hang around with? What do I believe? I didn't know. I didn't know any of those questions. And I was just going through the motions. I think all of us do go through the motions until something comes and stops us. And Grief is a big one that will come and stop us. You know, um, there are many others as well, of course. And in fact, two years, so in, in 2017, well, just over two years after my mum died of cancer, I had a biopsy on my thyroid and that came back inconclusive. And so the recommendation by the surgeons was to have half my thyroid removed, which I did. Now, in hindsight, I wouldn't have had that done. If this was today, I wouldn't have that done. But at the time, that's what I did. And so that put me on a spiral of illness. I had to navigate uh, an autoimmune experience and how to heal myself and how to, yeah, just come back from that because I, I was in another hole, like an illness hole. And so all these th teachings have come along and I do see them as teachings rather than, you know, a victim. Things happen to me, they, they happen for me to, to really open my, open life up for me. And did you have that, that mindset to be open-minded to whether it's the law of attraction or, or you know the, those things of spirituality sounds quite hippie-ish but i know i know that it's, it's more as that mindfulness i guess did, did you were you that type of character anyway because i i love all of that stuff but I, I feel like i would respond in a very similar way to to the way you did um I, deep down i was deep down but i repressed it and only, you know, the first book I read after my mom died was a Tibetan book of living and dying. And there's so many powerful teachings in that. But for me, the, the thing that stood out to me is like, wow, there's a whole culture of people 
who devote their life to being present at the end of death or at death. And they, they talk about that as a transition, not a final moment. And so I just was fascinated about esoteric traditions, wisdom traditions, uh, indigenous cultures. It's put me on this like, this information of like different perspectives, different, how do other people live their life? How do other cultures, how do other countries? And, you know, that's one thing I've always had. I love travel and I love experiencing the culture, not just to go to the, 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 the normal path, but to go off the path, to live and experience and try. And, I, and I'm grateful that I've done that many times. And, it, and it's that curiosity. And I think, you know, spirituality, it's easy. I know what you mean when you say, you know, it's hippie, but I think that is what's missing. And it, when I say that, I paraphrase, you know, it doesn't need to be about, I don't, you know, there are so many different traditions. But for me, at the core level, spirituality is about connection to something bigger. And what I mean by that, nature, like each other, we're all connected, we're all connected to each other. And I think such of the pain and problems that we face is that disconnection. We feel we're so alone. There's a wonderful doctor, Zach Bush. Have you heard of Zach Bush? Zach Bush, MD, American guy, he's triple certified. So like very few people in America are triple certified. So in endocrinology, in palliative care, and in intensive care. It'd be wonderful to have on your podcast. Um, but he, so, I mean, and he's talking about a time in intensive care and, and he's saying that, you know, the resuscitation and the CPR and all this kind of stuff, even with the right machines, it has got a dismally low success rate, even if you're right there with all the equipment on the team. And on one night, you know, these three very different people, one was a rabbi, one was uh, a white guy who was suffering from complications of AIDS and another uh, was a black pastor. All on the same night, they passed away and they came back. And after they got re 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 reorientated themselves, kind of one of the first things they said was, why did you bring me back? And the second thing which surprised them most was that that was the first time I've ever felt fully accepted in my life. And, you know, hearing it from a medic, uh, 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 a Western trained doctor, highly acclaimed doctor, it was just, you know, I think, and those connotations are everywhere in our society. It's just what we're blinkered to. And this was my case. I just dismissed those things like that as fluff when, in fact, when you start to open up and to hear, it's, and that's what I find fascinating about life, like the mystery. The mystery, I don't know anything for sure, but I do know that I don't know, you know, and so, um, and so that just, just fulfills my life. It enriches my life. And then there are different practices that we can experience a different state. And that's, that put me on to, I've studied um, and qualified as a breathwork facilitator because the power of breath on so many levels in the moment and, you know, anxiety in physical performance and in non-ordinary states, you can enter into a breathwork practice and experience psychedelic experiences, a connection to something else, a dissolution of the ego just by breathing differently. And it's not, I'm not, you know, that's for so many, that's, that's around in our culture now. And, and that's what indigenous cultures have baked into their culture or with spiritual traditions. Whereas our Western culture is devoid of that. We have the external focus of achievement on stuff on, you know what I mean? And so rather than we're distracted from our inner world. And so just coming into, for me, if anyone's going to want to, um, Dr. Joe Dispenza has been, the primary person or the, the method that I've really taken to with regards to meditation, understanding myself. And, um, and it was so wonderful about him. He stripped away the dogma of spiritual tradition and underpins it with the neurophysiological aspects of what's actually happening when you meditate, when you do a technique and he puts these meditations together, practice this, do this, see what you experience N equals one. You know, and I think that's so important, right, to make judgments of what we hear other people say rather than go and experience something ourselves and make our own mind up. What was his name? Joseph? Dr. Joe, J-O-E, Dispenza, D-I-S-P-E-N-Z-A. Yeah. And he's, yeah, he'll, once you know about him, you won't, you can't miss him. <laughs> he's everywhere. Yeah. Well, again, I know this is very mainstream, but um, Headspace, I saw Headspace, a great right. six month free, great free uh, thing at the moment. So I'm going to sign up to that one because it's, I'm, I actually love all this stuff and the like Eckhart Tolle elements of those things, power of now and so on. Um, but I, you don't always practice it. And I, I remember my mate doing Headspace with me and I couldn't, I couldn't take it seriously because you're kind of listening to it and it's got that. However, 
having done it, I was at a, in a workshop with some other company owners last week and we did, we had someone, a guest speaker, and we just did, I think it was about three minutes of breathing. And it was like, the difference was That's incredible. That's like, I mean, and then she came around and said, right, give me one word of what helps you. And they all gave whatever word there was. But for my, my word was perspective, because it was, yeah. you go from being, everything is going on. You've got all these things, which I've constantly got things racing through. So all of a sudden you start listening to, I remember actively hearing the um, air conditioning unit. You just, you're in the moment, you're being yeah. present which, as you would say, that society is not set up for at the moment, or it's not encouraged, is it? You're constantly no multitasking on your phone, which I'm terrible for as well. You're doing this, or you're, and you're encouraged to multitask, aren't you? And it's like, well, that's it's not. you're not giving any attention to anything, and you're not really listening, you're not understanding, you've not got any intent, intent with it. So it definitely all resonates w w with me here, and... I think I'm definitely going to listen, listen to some of this here. But what? why do you think that, because I would say that the, you talking like this, this is not what 99% of what people tend to be like. It tends to be on the go, isn't it? Western society is always about achievement, success, numbers. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on like where, what, because you, Again, we're a, we're a commercial company. We we need to sell things to, to to exist in that respect. How do you pull those things together as well as alongside looking at like the more spirituality side and mindfulness side? I think there you can't separate them. I think it's not you know. I think a spiritual, if you want to call it a spiritual, or an awareness practice or awareness perspective on life marries so well to entrepreneurship because you know. You, for me, anyway, this is how I see it. Like, um, you know, you know, uh, how does it marry together? That's your question. What we think we become, and that's that is very easy to think. Oh, that's an esoteric, but you literally look at the neurophysiology. So, someone has a thought, a stressful thought. There's a biochemical, even more obvious. You have a an intimate thought around a partner. There's an actual physical change in the body, male or female. Same, any thought creates a physiological change. And so you put that time and again, what you practice thinking about becomes. And so one, you talked about that, like the, the space, creating space is not a necessity. It's Sorry, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. You know, and I bookend my days. First thing I do in the morning, wake up at five, get my practices with my wife before our daughter wakes up. We, we, rec we greet our daughter in such a wonderful space and we do it at the end of the day as well. And then eat, you know, during the day is also practice. Observing yourself, seeing yourself. And I think, what is success? It's easy, like you said, numbers. It's easy to measure numbers. Numbers, stats, KPIs, athlete injuries, whatever, whatever it is. But what's the internal success? What's the, what's the compass? What is that? You know, and, you know, working with coaches in sport, the, the thing that many of them share is the insecurity of the role so okay what if someone comes in to get fired okay well have you been successful well i've got fired well that doesn't mean anything have you been successful on your own measure another thing was you know like that i'm coming across like well okay you've worked with this team or that team or you've got this company or you're earning this much money or whatever it is when is enough when when would you be able to say okay like i'm gonna have some time now and, and it's connecting with that inner self. So, it, you know, it's a spiritual practice, but it doesn't have to be kind of labeled fluffy or anything. It's like literally, well, what are my drivers? What are my values? What are my needs? What are my wants? Simple questions, but so many. We all know them, but it's very few can actually articulate that. And when we can actually articulate it, all of a sudden you see them here and then you see, well, this is how I'm actually living. I'm miles away from them. And so the, you know, that's where I think they marry. It's like really like understanding yourself, which, which creates, because if you're, if our external measures are based on what other people think is successful, medals, money, status, house, car, watch, nothing bad with any of it. But if that, if that our happiness is determined on that, we will never be happy. It'll just fill a temporary hole. Same with relationships. You know, one of the biggest epiphanies of my life in this phase, I've had many, but one of them was, I used to have all these complaints about the positions I worked in. 
oh, this is not right. This is not performance, blah, blah, blah. And I also had a lot of complaints about my, my partners, my relationships. She does this. Oh, no, she does that. Oh, no. And it was just all of a sudden, like the lines, like the dots lined up, and it's just like point an arrow straight into me. He's like, I am the only fixed variable here. Oh, no. But also, oh, great. Like, right. Well, I need to start looking at myself. What's going on here? I didn't have a clue what was what to do, but it was all of a sudden like I need to look at myself. I'm 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 playing victim here all the time. I'm, I'm blaming everyone else rather than taking responsibility. So yeah. that's how I that's how I see it, Marion. I don't know if that answers your question, but it... no, no, it definitely does, definitely does. And I think I think those internal drivers, and I, I'm a big believer in that the law of attraction. And, so am I, and man. just yeah, what you're putting out, it's not. I mean, even me saying this, I shouldn't probably say, but like, it's not always easy if you are feeling flat to think, oh. right, I need to flip that. And, you know, I listen to The Secret, like putting on some music and I think doing some breath work, putting on a good piece of music, whatever it is. I think it's being aware of what helps you flip states mm. is really, really important. Um, um, I just, uh, sorry, I'm just going to jump in on that because one, it ties in your little love, Joe Dispenza, because it, it's very much based around that. It's underpinned by science and you know a secret i think one thing the secret that doesn't mind that my remembrance doesn't get highlighted it's not you've got to have the vision you've got to have the vision and think yes and affirmations but you've got to feel it so it's one thing to see what you want and to know what you want to be you have to feel that and that's where joe dispenser's work you know the many of us are walking around with resent resentment lack and a sense of lack a sense of not worthy all deeply inside we can't really see and so we, it's about cultivating different emotions that we do want transferring lack into abundance transferring anger into joy or pain into love you know and that's a skill you can do that and the for example part of the, the science that underpins is the you know, heart math institute an amazing organization and works with joe dispenser at times so the heart is connected to the brain and so there's a two-way relationship Forty thousand neurons in the heart and so when we feel fear, like emotions of fear or resentment or anger, the wave, that's the electromagnetic wave that's generated from the heart is incoherent. Means the, and so the brain and the heart are not communicating. When we feel love, gratitude, abundance, our heart is coherent. Our heart and brain is, is connected. And that wave stretches out several feet away from our body. And so, you know, it's easy to kind of dismiss this, but it's very measurable. And so we have this energetic body as well as our physical body. So to me, my understanding is our energy body is like the information. Our physical body is the printout. And this might sound far out. And to me, years ago, it did far, far, far out. But when you look at Joe Dispenza's work and many other people in this space now, it's, it's evident, very, very evident. And, you know, because it's come from me who studied to a master's level of, of the physical body of human performance. And I didn't understand it. I didn't know any of this at all. And, you know, you're talking about like, the, and that, that's what I mean. Like we, what signal are we giving out? What energetic, and it, uh, to land it in the real life, we've all walked into a room after someone's had an argument or someone's angry, someone's pissed off. You can you pick up on it. Nothing needs to be said. That's what we're picking up on. The same if someone tried to sneak up behind you, you, you sense them. That's what we're picking. They're in that energy, that energy field. And it, it's very, you know, it took me a while to get my head around this, but like I, it's not the knowledge, it's the embodiment of the practice of that. And Joe Dispenza has helped me do that in a fundamentally powerful, profound ways. And you just have to enter into his practice. And um, if you can go to one of his work, his retreats, because they're mind blowing. Um, mm. Yeah, no, I think that, that really is fascinating. And like, to, to add on there, like when you say someone's got a presence, they walk into a room and they don't necessarily need to say anything. And you, you just go and you know they're there. You know yeah. someone comes in with whatever it is. It's like, I mean, even like with like girls, like, you, yeah. you know, if you're if you're giving off a vibe of, yeah, confident, whatever, you were saying before about those people that you aspire to be. Is they've got that whatever it is confidence. So there's there's loads of different environments of, you know, I know from going into sales meetings when you're going in like, yeah. boom, it it comes across like mm. that. Whereas if you're going in buzzing, you just you've you've got that aura of confidence or belief of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Similar to what I said, like when I 
been to China there, like you're sort of going in maybe a bit sceptical, um, as you will do in a lot of places, but then you sort of come out and it's just like very natural that you're, you just have got complete belief in something. And it's not just his body language, it's, it's probably, it's everything mm -hmm. as well as the, the physiological stuff that you were mm -hmm. saying there. So I, I definitely believe it. Um, and I'll, I'm definitely going to check out Joe Dispenza. Um, so maybe you've answered that question there, but how would, how would you recommend getting into, into understanding this and, and, because it's, it's all about changing your, your mindset, I guess. Your mind your, and your thoughts, you know, yes, being aware yeah. of the type of thoughts that you have. And the, the first place I would start is, you know, what patterns can you see in your life? And my example of like, well, I'm complaining about this and this and this and all these different environments, but there's this one key theme coming out. So what do you notice? And it, and it really is about no, putting the phone down, shut the TV off, stop reading, stop listening to podcasts and start noticing which is really uncomfortable, you know, to start with. And uh, Tristan Harris from uh, Center of Humane Technology, I think it is, you know, he, he'll call it, our phones are like adult pacifiers. We can't, none of us can bear to be bored. None of us can bear to be alone without anything to do. We reach for it. It's, it's so ingrained in us. And, and so notice that. Define the times that you connect with your phone. What is the first thing you do in the morning? What is the last thing you do at night? Most people will say, look at their phone. And so how do you want to be, you know, when we connect with our phone, we're connecting to all the things that are known, our personality, the people we know, all this kind of stuff. Well, the morning then, before you check your phone, can you create something new? How do you want to show up? How do you want to feel today? What's going on for you today? What, you know, like simple questions that, and this is why I do what I do in the morning with my wife and I, like, we don't want to be defined or controlled by a device. We don't be controlled about from our past. Like bring all of that to your awareness, which is a, a life's work. But it's um, I can tell you that it's so worth the struggle because without freeing yourself in that way, we stay trapped to our programming, to our conditioning, to the environment. As long as we're all, we're connected to the environment, it controls us. If something happens and we have an effect inside and we don't change that, the outside then controls our inner world. If we can regulate ourselves, then we are free, because we could, no matter what happens outside, it's not to not feel emotions or feelings, but if we stay in that, then that's controlling our, our inner world. And so that to me is true success, true peace, true freedom, is that, is that, that self-regulation of, of what's going on for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, I think that's that's really interesting, and I'll ask you a question after this. But I, I read a book called "The Obstacle Is the Way" recently, yeah, right. and I, I just thought that was brilliant, and it kind of mm -hmm. shifted me. Like even reading the first couple of chapters, just your perspective on things is mm -hmm. just like it can change straight away of how you mm -hmm. look at a challenge or obstacle or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I think it's I, I I love all of that area. So in terms of like your your practice in the morning and in the evening, what, what, how does that look? So I wake up, uh, so yeah, about five. Get out of bed, quarter past five. Uh, straight away, have a glass of pint of water, then sit down and meditate with Joe Dispenza. The various meditations he does. So I'll do anywhere between an hour to an hour and a half. My wife does well, um, and that's it's so it's, the fundamental practice of his. It's really about bringing awareness to this to disconnecting from our body, dissolving our sense of sense, our sense of us, and connecting with the power, the, the realm of thought. And so if we're connected to the realm of thought, what do we want to think? How do we want to be? What do we want to believe? What do we want to create? And it's really it's connecting to the idea of that and the feeling of that. And the feeling of that is simply, well, if I think of something that you want, that you're aiming for, how will you feel when you've achieved it? So you've got the stuff, how will you feel? Usually it's a sense of freedom. Usually it's a sense of joy. Usually it's a sense of grateful. And so how can you feel that? Can you connect to that feeling before the event has happened? And so it's really this process that you go through and, and it's also liberate a breath practice. So it's a breath out, contract your pelvic floor, lift your breath, pull the breath through your body, keep your awareness on the top of your head and then squeeze and lift, squeeze and lift. And the point of that is to uh, bring 
breath and energy through the body. Now you'll only understand this once you practice it, but um, just check out Joe Dispenza and breath. Um, but really in a, in a spiritual text, it's the Kundalini breath, breath of fire. Um, if, you, if you're open to that, that space. And, um, and so it's just this liberation of energy. You know, it's just, and I can tell you, it's just, it's once it took, took me a while to, to learn it, but once I learned it, it, this euphoria, this ecstasy from this, from this breath coming into my brain. And he's got, all, he's got all the science to underpin it and the measurements of what happens and why it's happening and what is why you're doing it. So I'll let you to, to, to the listeners to check that out. But, and so I, I leave my meditations in this, in this wonderful space. At times, the meditations are really challenging. Maybe I've got resentment or anger or shame or whatever it is, but I'm feeling it. I can't change it, but I stay with it. Because if I get up and just ignore it, it's still there. I haven't converted it. And it's usually old. It's showing up. It's an old, familiar feeling. It's nothing to do with right now. And so it's that practice of, of generating a new emotion that I want to experience. Then I get up, then I'll do a little bit of yoga, or then I'll go straight to the sea. And so my wife and I take it in turns each morning. I'll, I'm really close to the sea, so I'll go in the sea all year round, so cold exposure. And then I'll train three, four times a week, so still lift weights or do some intervals, that kind of stuff. Um, that's my morning routine. And then with my daughter, with my wife, take my daughter to school, um, work. I don't check my phone until about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, yeah, I just don't check it. I've, that's a habit now. I don't, I don't, I don't have any notif notifications um, other than text message. Um, and that's it. And then my day starts and I'm kind of got my, at the end of my each working day, I write a list down of my most in, three most important tasks. So say I leave to pick my daughter up at three o'clock. So at three o'clock, just before I write down, right, I need to achieve A, B and C. Not I need to write a book. I need to do that. Like measurable things, right? I want to write three paragraphs tomorrow on this topic or because I'm writing a book as well to do with my work um, or I need to contact these people, whatever, you know, and, um, and yeah, that's my day. And then at night time, uh, you know, the uh, organization that I'll, I'll steer your listeners to and yourself, like it's to the flow genome project. Um, they've allowed me to really look at, uh, and I've trained with them quite a few trainings to look at life through new novel ways and kind of the, the idea of flow, and so what is flow? There's an acronym for STIR, S-T-E-R. So S stands for selflessness. Your, our sense of self disappears. We're in the moment. T is for timelessness. So sense of time distorts. Three hours can go past in five minutes. Like time is like, whoa, where'd that go? E is for effortlessness. We're just doing it for the love of doing it. Intrinsic motivation. And R is for richness, information richness. And so when we get into non-ordinary states, flow or other states, you know, a breathwork state, even as far as psychedelics, and you just look at the research in psychedelics is profound. And there are legal therapeutic supported networks that are now doing that around the world that I would highly recommend. And um, it just offers us a different perspective. There's connection, you know, like it, it's just, and I think it's a, it's a human, we're built to, to experience more than typically most of us do. Typically, we're stuck in this 21st century normal of micro PTSD, kind of stress, fibrillation. We're constantly alert. Our nervous systems are constantly wired. And then we add coffee and alcohol and cigarettes and kind of constant external stimulation rather than actually turning our awareness inwards and actively recovering, actively resting. And then you look at what, you, what causes chronic illness, autoimmunity, cancer, MS, Crohn's, all that kind of stuff is like you cut, impossible to take out the emotional, mental aspect to physical disease. And Joe Dispenza will talk about that. Gabor Mate is a lead, world leader in that space. And, you know, starting to look at like if our nervous system can't, isn't in a place to repair, rest and digest, then it can't repair. We're constantly in vigilance. And so that, that's kind of, I guess, the basic of my day. And, what what underpins that? Why that's why I do that? Are you saying so? You you do meditation for an hour in the morning? Did you say? Yeah, I mean, try not to see it as that's the typically the, the length of time, hour to an hour and a half. There are shorter ones. I think you know quality over quantity as always. But um, yeah, like it's, it's just what state do you want to be? Sometimes it takes me longer. Sometimes I can get into a state really fast. And you know, there's a certain practice that that because when we're in our thinking mind, we're in beta brainwave activity 
And so the idea of meditation and the preparation to get into meditation is trying to calm that down into alpha. And then ideally yeah, entering into theta and delta states, waking delta states, which his research proves, you know, that, that's not very common to hear about, but it's very common in his work. And it's just this beautiful connection to something else, the energy within me and around me. And, you know, if that's far out, people are turning off now, but I highly just practice it. Don't, have you experienced it? Have you tried to experience it? Or is this based on your preconceptions of what others have said? And if it's based on preconceptions, then you don't know. So then practice and give it some time. Don't give it one day and give it some time because that's, that's been one of the biggest mental changes I've had to make is to be aware of what my assumptions are. And it's challenged my assumptions of what I thought the human body could do or what I thought the human body was. You know, coming from, like I said, elite sport and, and masters in physical performance, and this is what the body is, and learning all about that stuff, which is all great and all wonderful. It really is. But it was missing this concept. And to me now, modern performance in whatever realm will include the energy realm as well. Undoubtedly. I'm 100% can know that and because I've, I've experienced it and the amazing research has happened. Mm. What are your thoughts on the likes of Tony Robbins? I've never been to an event. I know a few people have, and they've had a good time. I think that, you know, that's I've, from what I've heard, what happens, he gets people into an altered state. You know, he gets them up, gets them cheering, gets them like, and, and we can't change from the same level of mind that, we, that creates the problem. So if we're trying to set our problem in our mind, and we can't do it, Einstein said that. And it's just, you, you need to elevate the emotion. So if we've had some form of, we have to, we have to come at it from a different level. And so an elevated state in however we want to do it allows us to change our internal narrative and internal. That's why psychedelics are so effective in the right set and setting with a therapy. Mm. But I think, I think Tony Robbins is doing great things. I don't know what you think about him, but um, from what I've heard, um, he's doing great things. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's been prominent. I've known of his stuff for years and like, read, read a number of his books. And it's just impressive. Like he's obviously very charismatic and he gets people on board and I've, so I've had some friends that have been to his thing and they are, I think mixed mixed reviews but I can understand why those people may have had those as well so I think it's like you say being open open to this stuff um yeah that's that's all really interesting and so how did this lead you to doing men behind sport then well so like I said I left I left coaching athletes in 2018 my last job was with the British ski and snowboard team slope style and half pipe and uh, at the end of 2021 i started reaching out to uh you know i was subjectively successful in my career yeah i suffered with foster syndrome anxiety self-doubt kind of just not being comfortable in my skin so i thought well i started to reach out to people did you know this is what happened to me did you experience that and so from a few people at the end of 2021 and now i've had 156 interviews uh with all men working in all sports, in all continents, in all roles. So performance directors, head of performance, physios, SNCs, physiologists, nutritionists, psychologists, uh, you know, the whole lot uh, in college in America, top, top level college football, uh, professional football, international football, cr around the world, cricket, rugby, uh, institutes, EIS, um, everywhere, like literally everywhere in every continent. It's blown me away. Many of the people I've spoken to have, are top uh, or have been there or are in, in, or in and around the, the, the high levels. It's just blown me away. Like saying the thing, you know, experiencing that imposter syndrome, self doubt, improving athletes at the expense of themselves, never feel enough, never feel uh, constantly striving for the next thing, chasing this thing, and they don't know why. They keep, they think it's progression, but it's just their. And they've, they've achieved it and they're still feeling this sense of it's not quite right. I'm not quite there. The cost of all of that that I'm hearing about divorce, absent parent, short term relationships or lack of intimacy with their partner or with anyone, really. Um, burnt out. So that and, and so really my, my the reason and going back to losing my dad, you know, I'm really interested in how do you measure your measure your benchmark success what are your drivers who are your role models you know and so men behind sport is, is literally providing a service that i didn't have 
and there are a few people doing this and it's not just me and I, I hope this sparks many more and I'm in conversations with different organizations institute to see how they can in, bring this into their environment because it's so deeply needed uh, you know I've spoken to many many people who are drinking too much who can't be alone they overwork because they can't be alone with their thoughts they by their own by their own words they're emotionally unskilled like I was um, they're tired of the banter they're tired of just the two the, the putting on a show putting on a front of work you know and again what I'm hearing about from all those interviews is men want emotional and spiritual connection with each other and all I mean they want depth they want to they want to be able to say how they feel and without being judged and so what I'm doing, men of high school, one is to be a voice for that, to really start doing this kind of, you know, growing it now and it's, it's getting out there now and there's more, there's loads of traction. People are really interested in the story that I'm telling. Um, and like I said, I'm writing a book on what I'm finding and, and two and three, I suppose I'm providing that, that coaching service in the best way that I know how. Um, at the moment it's online, but it will be going to in-person retreats next year where we'll come together, start in the UK and come together and bring coaches together from all walks of life and just really start to deconstruct, you know, looking at them, the man behind the sport, not their position. That's what they do. That's part of what they do. But looking at the person, their drivers, you know, uh, and, and connecting that with, em with embodiment practices, breath work, mm -hmm. for example, to really to offer new perspectives and to sort of soften the grip we have on our identity of, of working in sport and to analyze, like, like I said, I think we all, we can, Sport can be a lifelong career as long as we become aware of our, being able to set our boundaries, how to say no, what we're saying no, if we're saying no, what we're saying yes to, you know, and, and yeah, it's, uh, that's my why, I suppose, behind the Empire in Sport. Yeah. Yeah. I've uh, been to your perspective on this. So I spoke with Kelvin Giles um, not long ago and fascinating guy, still really passionate. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that it's so fundamental that as kids really kids should just be playing getting on with it whereas at every level of whether it's elite sport or even amateur sport is it's always numbers driven it's yeah did you win did you what's your the funding even is based on that for what medal did you win what was your position uh like the, the if you look at the i was watching my nephews play football and it's like i've been playing since they're like three playing in games it's just like it's not doesn't seem right that it's really talking to you about in it as you though you're an adult. No. Mm. Yeah. No. What are your thoughts around all of that? Yeah, I think I think because if you look at the reason why is that it's money, money at the top. You know, the next asset, the next star, the next, and it's I agree completely. It's not. It's just a, and I, I I would go as far as to say I mean my daughter my daughter's in in a Montessori school because the idea of knowledge retention and following a formula a set preconditioned formula that the child children have to fit into otherwise they're labeled adhd or whatever it is rather than well each child is on their own journey allow them to go on that journey and offer obviously there is a framework but allow them to go through their own experience and like you said play you know kind of just play there's no outcome just enjoy it my daughter does gymnastics uh jujitsu and um, ballet and, you know, I'm so grateful I'm a parent now in this time of life rather than 20 years ago. I would have been a terrible parent back then. Whereas now it's like just, you know, I, in fact, I'm probably the other way. Like, I'm like, oh, no, don't be. Let's do it. Don't want to, you know, just like rather than go, you've got to win. Um, just enjoy it. Just ha have fun. And she is having fun. And you see them have fun. You know, even down to the idea of you could give her a stick and she'll make a million games up out of it don't need stuff just allow allow them to have fun be creative it it's really the goal of being a parent is to allow the person to unfold that's how i see that and mm. and i'm grateful i am at my end so i think yeah kids need to play just investigate there's no like there's no rush there's no rush well, yeah, interestingly, so that, that workshop that I mentioned I went on last week, so it was led by this this woman. It was a really good day, but as part of it was to kind of get us into this state was we started playing these games, and they were like, really put you out of comfort zone. You've got to do these like childish things of, say, bouncing or throwing an imaginary ball. And I think the point was to kind of say that we're so stiff. I, I definitely have those things, and it's like, 
oh, I'm getting this wrong. And it's like, yeah, all of that fun is just completely been taken out of us. We're all self-conscious. You all don't want to look embarrassed. Um, and it's just like that just limit creativity of of things. And you're also not living in the moment because you're just you're so self-aware, but not in a healthy way. Mm, so much. And I think that's one of, one of the many wonders, wonderful things about being a parent is you get to play like that again because you've got a reason to, you know, and you can get my daughter is just forces me to step out of my comfort zone, you know, and I, and I want to be on a model for a, a dad who's active, who's taking part. And so, you know, I remember she was about three and we went for a walk and we we're coming back, coming down, walking down from Hive Station, which is a busy station, a commuter station. It's like half five or six o'clock and all these people coming down and she goes, daddy, I want to look at the stars. Look at the stars. Let's lie down. And initially, I was like, oh, no, we can't lie down here. And I, I just did. Just lay down. Lay down the flat, like star-shaped. We were just looking at the sky and all these people walking past us or over us. And most people were laughing and smiling. And it just was like, oh, yeah. Like, I'm so glad I did that. And that just – there are many other examples like that. And it's just the, the wonder through someone's – through a child's eyes that they see life through a different way. And it's just amazing. Mm. Great. Yeah, no, I'm conscious we've had you for a long time now. But what, what's your plans for the future then? You've mentioned the book and the retreats. So what, what, what are your plans going forward? So, yeah, like um, to keep the online. So the online, like I do one-to-one -one coaching as well as the group coaching, which has been amazing. But, yeah, the, the, the in-person retreats is where I really want to take this. Um, my wife and I held retreats before COVID, before COVID hit. And then um, we haven't done, I haven't done one since. So we want to start that. I want to start it up again next year with, um, with coaches. Um, and then I just want to kind of, I'm having conversations with UK sport, UK coaching, kind of, you know, like really starting to reach out to, to big organizations such as that. And anyone who's open to learning from, I guess, what I'm seeing and, and uh, the University of Stirling are interested in, in doing some research. We're using some of my work in research as well. So there's such, you know, the irony of that actually is in my career, I was trying to get stuff published and trying to do this stuff. And now I'm not even thinking about it. And people are interested in my work. It's just like the irony of, oh, isn't that strange? But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I just to, just to, just to, uh, open this conversation up more and more and to spread the word and that's hopefully to inspire more coaches to to one they are in control of their life and things can be different and it's just that stickiness inside getting to turn you turn your awareness inwards and you're there's a vast amount of information in there that you, that that will transform your life and what's your background uh, wife's background she is, uh, you know, she's a, a yoga teacher, a graphic designer. She's done yoga for like 25 years. She's <laughs> not just a physical practice, but you know, the philosophy of it. And even that, you know, I remember dismissing yoga years ago and now I'm married to a yoga teacher. And, and, and yeah, she's American, so she's from, you know, from uh, Cincinnati. And she's been amazing on so many levels, but has, uh, has helped me open my heart up. And what I mean by that, when people said, when people used to say, oh, open your heart, I'll connect with your heart, what do you mean? And so to me now, like, open your heart is literally like being aware of what happens when you're feeling vulnerable, when you're feeling angry. What, what's physically happened to your body? So it's, there's contraction, there's a closing, there's an uh, activation of the nervous system. So when you feel grateful, when you feel love, it's about softening, opening to that. And so that, I had to learn how to do that. I think many of us, men in particular, are guarded. We're so not used to being like that. We're defensive. We're kind of, you know, on the verge of aggression versus love and compassion and openness. And I think my point in saying all that is there's, there's a intimacy has been taken to levels I didn't understand before me, Elena. And yeah, yeah that's the practice of yoga and not just a physical practice, but the understanding of yourself and connecting with yourself. Right. No, a lot. I've really enjoyed that today. So thank you. And it's you've definitely given me some take home stuff to do. So, yeah, Joe Dispenza and some of the other people that you've mentioned. So I really appreciate you sharing your journey and what you plan to go into. And it's, it's I can see it's it's deep rooted within you, which is great. And it's very genuine. So that's it comes across like that as well. So 
I really appreciate your time and um, I look forward to, to seeing where, where your stuff takes you. Thank you very much for, for having this conversation and, um, and being so open yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.